I'll tell you what, like when we were, uh, when we do webinars, I often get the chance to sort of sit in the waiting room ahead of time. And obviously, as Jeff mentioned, we're all remote. Um, and this is a great group to work with. I've had the pleasure of working with Orange Tree in the past. Um, Jeff and Renu, I really appreciate having uh, you guys inviting us to be here. And, uh, you know, as you did your intro to your company, a couple things really resonated with what we're about to talk about. And it is the whole idea of business continuity and reflection and, and planning, right? And when you look at that continuity of service and, and really the continuum of, an, uh, continuum of an employee's life cycle, it is interesting that probably the bulk of the callers, uh, the participants today, uh, do a lot of pre-employment testing. Um, and it is a single point of information about that candidate who hopefully is a su successful employee for your organization for many years. Um, when you look at your employment life cycle, you know, when I, when I started in the workforce, I was relatively young. Um, and when I, when I, uh, you know, just out of college actually. And when I left that very first company I was with 22 years later, I had four girls, was married, had moved a couple times and was a very different person. And so I think it really is that business continuity and that employee continuity and the concept of monitoring is very important and shouldn't be ever construed as a negative, right? It is it's very much what we want to do. We want to say, safe, we want to stay productive, and we want to ensure that we are growing for our employees and that our employees are growing in alignment with us. So today, I'm going to skip over um, the slide that is me, because um, I already got that introduction. Hold on. And let's talk about what we're going to review. I always like to start by saying this is the agenda, introduction, you know, marijuana overview and updates, impairment. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about. I'm here to tell you a story that hopefully will stick with you and it will resonate because I can sit on today's webinar and throw around a whole lot of fancy terms like, you know, six monoacetyl morphine, uh, you know, cannabinoids. It, it doesn't matter. What you need to do is understand how this is an important part for you and your business. And it's important. Now, I would normally say it is important, but it's not urgent right? I can no longer say that because as we go through what is happening, the urgency is coming. It's getting more and more intense. So in this industry, years back, we were looking at marijuana and marijuana legalization. And I'd say that the bulk of the people that, that I have grown up in this industry with said, it's never going to happen right? Never going to happen. Then it moved to, oh, it's never going to happen, but it's probably at least not going to happen in like the southern states. That'll take a longer time. Well, it's happening, right? It's happening. And so with marijuana legalization, we are seeing a significant change in the employment screening industry. And and I, I promise every caller, I promise every participant that I did not before this minute, hear what Jeff's introduction was to what's happening at Orange Tree, but it's lovely when things line up like this, right? Because the, it, the alignment is real. We are looking at a fast-paced, technology-based employee and candidate market. We are looking at how do you have the most up-to-date, the most recent information, and then how do you trust but verify? And trust but verify is really important because it is on behalf of your customers, whatever you are doing, your organization, your shareholders, your owners, you know, whoever you are, it is that you are trusting and you're verifying that things are at the best place and in the best way they can be for your organization and for your you know, shareholders, stakeholders, right? So marijuana legalization, although people would have said it's never coming, it's here. And there are like just volumes of information as things change each day that go through. And we'll, we have some upcoming slides about where the legislation is and what it is. But I don't actually want you to focus on which states are legalized, which states aren't, which 
which states are recreational, which states are medicinal. What I want you to know is it's here and it's not going away. You've got to deal with it. It is important and it is becoming more and more urgent every day. If marijuana is legalized under federal law, it doesn't change much for you as an employer. In many ways, it actually doesn't change much for you as a citizen either. So the, the, the issue with marijuana and legalization is it is a Schedule I drug, which simply means that it cannot be prescribed for any reason. Now, even with that, there are exceptions. So Marinol and Dronabinol have been around for a really long time, which means that the companies who own that went through the steps of getting marijuana, testing it, getting an FDA cleared drug and getting it to the market, right? But with those few exceptions, it's technically still illegal to be prescribed. There is no, with those few, few noted exceptions, right? There's no ability for you to, to go to your local pharmacy chain, you know, Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, whoever you're going to and saying, yeah, give me my prescription. And they're going to hand you something and say, yeah, here's this. You're going to take it every two hours or four hours as needed with, you know, with water and, and food and don't drink grapefruit juice while you're taking this stuff. That's not how it works. If marijuana in some future state is changed and taken off of that Schedule One drug, what that really means is that those pharma companies have better access to do the testing required to get FDA cleared drugs onto and into the marketplace so that you can go to that local pharmacy and have them prescribed. And you're gonna see that thing that you're so used to on anything from like a pain reliever bottle to your script that comes with like the volumes and volumes of pages on it that says what you can and can't do, what are the things that could be common side effects, what are things that won't be. That's what will happen with that. And it really remains to be seen how much of that will happen now that it is so available in the market. And so that's the next phase of this, right? It is available in the market. Whether or not you are in one of these green states where it's legal for adult use and every state has some level of complexity about what it means and what they're doing and how you can use it and when you can use it and where you can buy it and you know what are the rules, right? $175 million, million adults have access to legal marijuana, right? If you look on that map, if you paid attention in geography, which by the way, I barely did, you'll see a tiny little state on the far side that's east and that's New Jersey. I happen to be in the big one next to it, Pennsylvania. If I got on my sneakers, tennis shoes, whatever you call them, in your neck of the woods, and I got walked out my door right now and I walked, in a half an hour, I would be in New Jersey. Right over the bridge, I happen to live right next to it. So I have access to it. Now, is it technically legal for me to go over there? I don't know, I've got a place at the shore, got a residency, I don't know. If you're gonna hire me, I don't know, right? Awfully vague. The answer is it's there, it's in the workplace. So people have access to it, right? And so you've gotta consider it. And that's why I said, you know, a lot of people, Sammy Dabbs, who is our vice president of, of sales at, at Hound Labs, she keeps just meticulous notes. And we have a, a, a compliance lead, Doug Boxer, who's fabulous at, at telling us when things are changing, what's changing, what's coming, where it's coming, what do the laws mean, how do you insert it into the policy, what all of that matters, but it doesn't really. It's here and you've got to deal with it. And that's why it's urgent. You can no longer say, oh yeah, no, I'm you know, I'm in the great state of Texas and we're not going to touch it. Oklahoma's right above you and they have some access or they're going to have access. Louisiana is right next to you and it's medicinally legal, right? And so you've really got to just start to address it now. That's where that urgency comes in. Not that you have an intimate knowledge of if the governor is supporting the adult use in 2021 or if there's a ballot, a ballot initiative likely in 2022. It's coming. And so you've really got to be used to it. And you've got to understand how are you going to use it and deal with it in your policy. This 
is the details, right? So you you can get these details, and again, they're they're available for everyone to see, but it's just real, and you've got to understand that it's real. And if you are in one of these states, like me, Pennsylvania, where you're saying uh, it's coming, um, you do need to pay attention. You should be vocal. You should be reading what those ballot initiatives are or what the support measures look like and starting to think about how specifically you are going to deal with it. But what is interesting is it is forcing our industry, that's the drug testing industry, that's the, you know, the background screening industry, to look at this idea of what was drug testing, what was it meant to be. Oddly, drug testing started really in this country a million years ago, but it really gained popularities in the Reagan era, just say no, dare. Um, and during that time, believe it or not, I started in 92. Um, so I was really here at the infancy of this. And the issue was always actually impairment. The problem was the tools weren't there to define impairment. The issue is they're still kind of not here to define impairment, right? And so drugs and alcohol vary. And we're gonna talk about that. And we're gonna talk about why that's important for you to understand. But again, you've gotta say, you know, is it time, is it urgent, is it now? These stats tell you that they are. So most of these stats, we always have information. You can go and check us. We've always got our source, right? But most of these stats are not verified by a drug test. These are people admitting, right? This is a survey called High at Work. And they ask, how often do you go to work high? 39% of the people who responded said at least once a week. 10% said high at work every day. 14% of managers said it's somewhat likely that they'll consume during the day. So the increase has in of, of people who are high at work is about 60%. I will go back to the litmus test of this are this is what people are telling us, right? And so in I maybe I'm a little bit jaded. I, I was joking around in the beginning of the call with with Jeff and Renew about I have, I have four teenage girls, right? So maybe I am slightly jaded. I will own that. But the truth is, I'm guessing that there's more who weren't willing to admit it. When my kids were little, I used to say to them, I thought they would be fibbing and I'd say, stick out your tongue and show me the black dot. And they were like, what are you talking about? And I'd say, no, 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 grownups can see. If you're fibbing, there's a big black dot on your tongue and only grownups can see it. That's why we wear these funny glasses sometimes so we can read things, we can see it. Inevitably, the one who did it didn't stick out their tongue. And so I'd know, right? I'm guessing there's a bunch of people who wouldn't stick out their tongue and admit that they go to work high every day, every week, once a month, every day, you know, so, so take this with a grain of salt. It's alarming as stated. It's even more alarming when you think about how many people aren't sticking out their tongue and owning up to it. And so the dam is breaking, right? The shift has come and everyone is saying, well, that's not true, right? So 60% of people are saying, yeah, we are okay with it. We realize it's here. We know we can't stop it. The dam is breaking, but what everybody is saying, but we all have skin in the game. We all have a reason to be concerned and that reason might vary, but we're all in it together. And we've got to figure out how we are going to hold back the waters and be prepared for when that dam does break. What, what is interesting, what we found at, at Hound is there are a lot of people who are aligned for different reasons, but nonetheless aligned, right? So unions, love to think about a test that is recent use for impairment. They're saying, yeah, it's here. But what we're tired of is we've got really good people who we feel like are being unfairly penalized because you're using a drug test that looks back, right? And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means looks back, but their concern is we have to terminate people. We don't want them. We want to protect our union employees. We've got insurance companies who are saying, hold on, hold on. All these governors are supporting these ballot initiatives. All these states are saying we're gung-ho about drug, about marijuana legalization. 
but wait a second, I, I think we have to pick up the bill, right? So when a workers' comp claim comes in, we've got to pick up the bill. We're even getting hit up on the other side, which is somebody's getting prescribed marijuana, kind of air quote prescribed, right? Because there's no way to prescribe it. We already talked about that. And yet they're asking us to pay for it, but we shouldn't pay for it, right? It's a schedule one drug. Well, what should we do? I don't know. How do we do with it? Do we have to pay for it? Oh, guess what just happened? Oh, we got sued. We got a lawsuit because somebody's saying we should have to pay for it because they're using it because they had an accident. Oh, wait a second. Accidents and incidents. We pay for those too. You got workers comp claim. Oh, wait a second. You hired somebody and then they did something really, really wrong and you got sued by a customer who had a slip and fall. And then that slip and fall resulted in the the good lawyer came back and said, yeah, but they don't do drug testing for marijuana anymore because they deleted it from their panel. And this person was on every single Instagram post and doing TikTok dancing with a joint in their mouth. So they were negligent in their hiring practices. And so I want my check to be way bigger. And so employers, insurance companies, unions, they're all saying, yeah, 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 we need this. Employers want to stay safe. They want to have a way to protect themselves. If they drop marijuana from their panel, we just heard what would happen, right? But if you continue to test, well, what happens? What happens if you test me because I had an accident? Or you tested me on the way to the job site, right? Because we already talked about the fact that pre-employment testing is that single blip. Well, what you really want to do and what the initial intent of employee drug testing was, is monitoring that entire lifetime of that employee. You want to maintain safety. You want to maintain productivity. You want to protect your stakeholders. You want to protect your customers. You want to protect your brand. And in doing that, you want to say to your, your, your employees and your, your customers, we trust our employees. They're doing a great job. We support our employees. We trust them, but we verify. And we verify because we do continuous testing. And so stop thinking about testing just being about pre-employment, post-accident, and reasonable suspicion because post-accident and reasonable suspicion are lagging measures. They are what happens after you go to vacation. And if you ever noticed in the swankiest resorts, in the nicest places, they have every amenity possible between the mini bar and the concierge, everything. They never have a scale. They don't have a scale because it's never good news. When you get on the scale and you get home from that vacation, the damage is done right? That's why there's all these great apps that people have where you can track what your food is and you can track on your watch how much you've exercised, how often you've gotten up. You know, did you get up in the hour? It's going to beep. It's going to ring and tell you you didn't get up, you didn't walk around, you didn't get enough rings on your app because it's prompting you to do the right thing before you step on the scale. And so what continuous monitoring, what pre-access testing does for you is it compels your employees to continue to do the behaviors that you need to keep your workplace safe and productive. And that works for everyone. And when you do it with the new technology that's available, what you find is you're not interfering with what they do on their own time because this is the balance, right? We got hiring, we've got safety, we've got fairness, we've got cost. You don't want to get rid of your best shift manager who you had to fire because they had an accident and they were positive, but you believed them. You believed that they used it. They told you it was Friday night. You know that it was not responsible use or it was responsible use. They're 21 years or older and you're in a legally re recreationally or adult use state. So now if you terminate them, not only are you as an employer losing a good employee and a good resource, you also are opening yourselves up to the liability of being sued for wrongful termination. And when you look at your drug test method that you're using, is it telling you the difference between the person who used on the job and that that use may have contributed to that accident? Or are you looking at what they did last week, last month, last two months, three months? 
And so you've got to think about that. So again, I'm not here to talk to you about the in-depth issues and what every, you know, picogram, nanogram uh, is, but you've got to think about what are you drug testing? What are you drug testing for? Is it actually meeting your needs? Or should you, as Jeff mentioned at the very beginning, be reflecting on why you're doing drug testing and look at it, not just for pre-employment, but the continuum of that employee life cycle. So candidates don't want to be denied employment if they're legally using, and that's fair. And they're confused too. They're like, wait a second, wait a second. I thought it was legal in this state. What do you mean? What do you mean I can't get that job? Right? Employees and employers want to make sure it's safe, right? Not only do they want to make sure it's safe, but having managed thousands of people in my career, when someone was underperforming, I would say 75% of the time, that lack of performance came to my attention first, not from my fabulous oversight and control, but from another employee, right? Because the downward impact of a lack of performance often is most impactful to the person sitting in the next desk, right? So-and-so is showing up for work late. So-and-so seems to be zoned out on the job. So-and-so keeps getting up to go to the vending machine and get a bunch of Doritos at their desk, right? That's all funny. It's not funny when so-and-so caused an accident that did something horrible. It's not funny when a customer gets lost. It's not funny when you have a data breach because somebody's high on the job, right? It's not funny when those sorts of complaints hit social media and then, you know, all of a sudden your brand, your restaurant, your operation is, is impacted negatively. And by the way, fiscally, right? So what if they take a credit card? What if they incorrectly um, allow for a credit card to be used? High on the job is not good. It's common sense. And it's not a debate about whether or not it should be legal, is legal, want to be legal, right? It's just a debate of common sense, in my opinion, that marijuana use is no different than, you know, when you sit and you watch Mad Men and you say, my gosh, how did they actually get any work done? They were always drunk. Same idea. So it aligns with employers who want to change policies, but you've got to have a new tool that enables the drug test to, to balance safety and fairness at the same time. The zero tolerance concept that really seriously five years ago, I probably would have said that's safe, right? Just say, nope, we follow the federal guidelines. We're okay. It doesn't work anymore because it doesn't align all of these issues. The current drug testing methods could have a positive long after impairment is over, if you say zero tolerance, you are opening yourself up for both the, the issue of, well, then you may be, you know, penalizing yourselves by getting rid of employees who are really good and who are using responsibly. You also may be opening yourself up for lawsuits when someone challenges you and says, wait a second, how does this align? When the lawmakers are making these laws, they are not thinking of this for you. You have to. So you've got to be vocal, and that's why you do have to pay attention to what's happening in your states and all the states around you. And, and in the age, you know, the, if you're in the, the occupational health and safety groups, if you're in SHRM, you really do want to be vocal because it is going to impact you. All of those impacts will ultimately hit your balance sheet because it's health insurance costs, it's risk, it's safety, it's workers' comp claims, it's productivity, it's turnover. And so you've got to be really paying attention. And that zero tolerance no longer works. So the bottom line is, how do you figure out what is impairment? The problem is this, we've had 120 years in the United States to figure out what is impairment for alcohol and alcohol behaves, it behaves in a person's body. So we have watched, you know, as the impairment level, the per se legal limit. Now the per se legal limit is not a perfect measure, right? No drug test or alcohol test is a perfect measure. So everybody knows the person who said, you know, you know, 100 pounds soaking wet, drank a bottle of something, you'd never know that that person was drunk versus the 
I don't know. She drank a glass of wine. I swear that was all she had. And I think she was pretty looped, right? So per se legal limit, the person who drank that glass of wine actually may not be impaired. I'm sorry, may be impaired, but they may not actually hit that threshold, that legal limit versus the other one who would, the legal limit, they would absolutely crush, but they're not technically impaired or not behaving as impaired. And so all of these are imperfect measures, but you've got to pick a number and you stick with it, right? It's no different than other qualifications that you have for employees. If you say on your job description, you're going to hire somebody who has got an MBA and four to six years experience, you may be disqualifying somebody who has a BA and 20 years of experience just on how you wrote that job description. It's an imperfect measure, but it's a measure nonetheless. What you've got to now look at is how are we going to measure impairment? And these lawyer, all these legislators don't know that answer because there was no answer. And so you've got to figure out how do you measure recent use and what's impairment for marijuana. And so as that all happens, we have to look at what are the existing technologies that are there and how do you use it? And then how do you make that part of your comprehensive program? And so that's our next section, but you got to think about that as you're doing this. And so hopefully I'm telling you the story that makes you understand why you need a strong and comprehensive program. You've got to look at those policies. You got to reflect on them, as Jeff mentioned, and you've got to say, do they meet? Is it fair for all my employees? Is it part of, have, have I really thought about this as terms of a risk mitigation strategy, right? Have I considered that physical safety is important, but brand protection, reputation, fiscal responsibility, IT, information security, how, are you protecting all of that with how you are performing your background checks, how you are performing your drug tests? And so along comes Hound Labs. I joined Hound Labs about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. Um, I had my own consulting firm for years in this industry after actually doing it, being a, a solutions provider. And I joined because I believe it is what we need. And, and we are bringing to market something that is needed because of all these things. We did not, yeah, we didn't create the problem, but we're here to help solve it. And so it was founded in 2014. We've, we've had fantastic success in, in fundraising and we've developed the first ultra sensitive marijuana breathalyzer. It's coming to the market later this year. Um, we actually have, have, have clients who are signing up to get a, get a hold of it ahead of time as part of our charter program. But the answer is why are they doing it? You need something that says this is recent use. Now, when you look at things like urine, it takes a couple hours to get into your system, right? So if you use marijuana, it takes a couple hours to get in. Now, is it a couple hours? Nobody can say for sure, right? And it depends because we are human beings. And so how all of these drugs operate, if you think of urine now and you look at your test, if I sat down with someone of equal height, equal weight, equal age, everything is equal as humanly possible. In fact, if I had an identical twin, which I don't, and we both smoked a joint that was the exact same strength, and we tested any of our urine, our blood, our saliva, our alcohol, for 15 minutes, it actually would be different every time. And that's not because the science isn't precise, it's amazingly precise across all of these drug testing methodologies. But like we said, you have to pick a line in the sand and maybe I just didn't inhale as deeply and hold it in my lungs as long. And so I had less than my identical twin. And so when you set like a 15 nanogram cutoff level for your GCMS with urine, if you continue to test us, well, tomorrow, my twin might get that job and I might not, or vice versa. It doesn't mean I didn't have drugs in my system. It doesn't mean I didn't have them at the same time. It just means I had them lower than that cutoff level. And that, those cutoff levels as a whole conversation in and of itself, but they're there and they're set for a reason. And the reason is to protect people um, and have a, a perfect measure that is imperfect, if that makes sense, right? So in the, er the era of legalization, you've got to do this balance of fairness and safety and zero tolerance no longer works. So what the breathalyzer does is it just measures the, the amount of 
delta 9 THC, which is the one that gets you high, right? That is in your lungs. It's not in your lungs because you breathed it in. It's in your lungs because it's metabolizing out of them. And it is only in there for a very, very short window at a very short level. So that allows you to measure very recent use. And uh, until, and if ever, an impairment level is defined. There are impairment levels in some states, but it's a made up number. It's not based on science. Somebody just picked it. Someone actually just picked five nanograms, I believe in most states. It's not based on any science. So just like I said, if my twin and I were sitting here and we smoked our joint at the same time and we had an accident, I might have less in my system. I still may be impaired but you've got to really pick what your line in the sand is. And that's what those levels are, right? And so what we wanted to look at at Hound was we wanted to develop a technology that stopped. So urine starts at about an hour out, oral fluid starts really quickly after marijuana is used. The problem isn't when it starts. Now hair is another story altogether, right? Because it's like a week before it gets in your hair. Blood, we just don't really use in workplace. There's a lot of applicability to it, but it doesn't work for workplace testing. So what you want to do is you want to think about what testing methodology are you using. You don't use hair testing for post-accident because it doesn't make any sense. You're not going to pick it up that quickly. But the issue is when you look at urine, it can last for days, weeks, theoretically, you know, months. If you look at saliva, you've got two to three days, depending, 12 hours to two to three days. If you've got hair, you've got that bump, right, where it starts after a week and then it can go for months and months. And then again, we don't use blood. So you've got to think about when you're testing these guys, well, what are you, what are you looking at? And so this is the peak window and these are the detection windows. And you've got to really consider what they are and what you're measuring and what does it mean to your company? If you look at the little blue one, right, it's that peak impairment window. Who sets the peak impairment window? Not me right? The peak impairment window was identified by NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Not the drug testing people, not the labs, not Hound Labs, not Orange Tree, but NHTSA, because they want to know how is driving impaired. Because again, most people are still thinking physical safety. And do not get me wrong, this is huge. We're not talking about it today, but right, what would you do? And, and, and remember, I've been here since the get-go. Drug testing started in earnest about safety and it happened as a result of some major accidents and loss of lives. And so the, the federal government came back and said, whoa, 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 we, you know, the Omnibus Act is in direct relation to that subway accident in New York where the subway driver was impaired by alcohol. And so what we don't want to happen is unfortunately happening already, which is accidents and incidents are happening on the highway. And again, there is no way to identify if it was from past use, because I could have smoked a joint, it could have been extraordinarily strong and I could be a user that uses all the time. And so that five nanogram thresh threshold could be my norm. Doesn't mean I was high when I was driving and I unfortunately caused that horrible accident. It doesn't mean I was high when I was working and I caused that horrible incident. So what you have to do is you've got to say, I don't, it isn't when it starts, it's how fast you cut it off. And so you want a drug testing methodology that aligns with that peak impairment window. So, you know, you, the, the high kicks in. And if you're thinking about like a bell curve, it's kind of like going back to, you know, science class people start getting more and more impaired as they go up, they hit this peak at about three hours and then they come down from there. And that's all you wanna see. And you might say, well, that is all I wanna see in an accident or an incident. But if you are in a state that is legal or you are acknowledging that it's everywhere, right? I walk out the hall, I've got a neighbor, it's eight o'clock in the morning. And sometimes I'm like, Mike, how do these people do anything? They're successful business people. My kids, when they were little, would say, Mom, why are there skunks in here? It's not. They just happen to be, you know, wake and bake. It's what they do. I just don't want them to work for me while they're stoned. I want to get the benefit of what I am paying for. And so what you are saying is, I want to do two things. I want to detect the use 
in the event of an incident or an accident. But really, when we start way back at the beginning of what is drug testing for, drug testing is a deterrent. It is a detection tool and it is a deterrent tool. And when used together, it aligns that trust but verify, right? Trust but verify. I want to keep you safe. I want to keep my customers safe. I want to keep my profit safe. I want to keep my other employees safe. And that safety is aligned across all things, physical safety, fiscal safety, all of the things we already talked about. So it's really important and that's what we do. We align with the peak impairment window and we test for that short period of time that is a matter of hours. We don't have the tail that the other drug testing methodologies do. Now I did mention we've been in business since 2014. I also mentioned we're taking orders for our initial units. Um, it was not an easy nut to crack. We needed to make a test that's simple to collect. The training is easy, right? We didn't want it to make it hard to do, hard to administer. You don't want to have a doctor who has to do it. So you can deploy it anywhere. It is heavy-ish, but it's easy to carry, right? So it's not two pounds, but when you get the base station and you get the handheld, it's easy to be carried by anybody and you can move it around but you can move it around because it's robust. Because remember, we talked about what we're not talking about, which is the roadside. And so we are also looking to move into the roadside market. But when you think about law enforcement, there's other aspects of it. And actually, we are going to market sooner than we want it to because the demand is so high, because many of you who are on today's call are stuck between a rock and a hard place. Again, not your fault but this is where we all sit. So we are coming to market quickly. We are getting this into the hands of people and then we're taking our orders because the need is so great for us to figure out how do we use this in our workplace, in all the different settings, whether you're an office setting or you're a, a manufacturer or you are you know, um, uh, a warehouse. Uh, those are the businesses right now that are thriving but also you've got all the other businesses that have these fi financial obligations that have you know, IT and info security that you've got to look at. So we needed to make it mobile, we wanted to make it easy, and we wanted to give you the ability to get an on-site decision. And so it really comes in these three parts. It's a, it's a cartridge, and then it's a base station and what we call our handheld. We probably could have come up with some fancy solution, but it, it's a handheld. And so what you do is you click that cartridge, it's a single use cartridge, it has tamper evidence and we followed all of the rigor that we do in drug testing in general. Single use mouthpiece. Obviously, when we started this in 2014, we weren't thinking about COVID, but we actually do have procedures so that it can be really self-administered under the watch of a collector who's trained. But it is a mouth, I'm sorry, a, a single use cartridge. It's opened, it's put into that mouthpiece or into the handheld, the handheld indicates, and you blow for two minutes, the donor, and that's how we collect enough breath sample. It can pause in between. It indicates both verbally, or, or audibly, sorry, audibly and um, in your sight line, you can see when it gets enough breath and then it shuts down, you lock that cartridge, it's sealed, and then you put the cartridge into the base station and you get that result in a matter of minutes. So you can safely identify the individuals who used marijuana recently and within that peak impairment window that was defined by NHTSA. So it allows you improved decision-making and you're avoiding all of those things we talked about in the beginning that you're trying to avoid, right? Making good decisions, unfair employment. So that is the solution. That is the reason we've spent the past six and a half years devising this solution. Um, the wait list is available uh, if, you would, if you're interested in joining, but what I hoped you came out of today is understanding why we've sort of started and why I chose to join Hound Labs. Um, this is an industry I love. I think it is very important. I think partners like orange tree, make it very successful for you. Um, but I joined Hound Labs because I think this is really where we're headed. And we are moving back into where we originally wanted to be, which is not just 
a single point in the life of a candidate, but the continuum of supporting successful employees and providing the excellent service that hopefully all of you are. So that's my information. I think we, oh, that's the disclaimer. Jeff mentioned the disclaimer. Um, and I think we have some time for a few questions. Nina, thank you very much. And, and thank you for that tongue test. I, I wish I'd known that as a dad with uh, with young children. I guess my wife probably did, but. I'm sorry, First question. That's a good one. There, there's a, a question about the calibration requirements. How is um, that completed if the system is on site? It is actually self-calibrated within the unit and we have details on how that works, but it's actually self-calibrated. So I know that, that you're probably somebody who's done alcohol um, tests before and you have to use the gas canister to calibrate. Uh, our future releases actually will include alcohol. Um, and with that, there'll be some added calibration requirements, but it is self-calibrated within the unit. And so you don't have to worry about it. Okay. You meant, you touched on this a little bit with your example of where you live and the proximity to Pennsylvania. There's multiple border state situations uh, in the U.S. You have a Chicago is a hub. People work in Gary, Indiana, work in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There, there's others, of course. So if an employee works in a state where it's illegal, uh, but their home state is legal, is, is there some kind of guidance you can can help the the audience here understand how to consider that in their policy? Well, you know what? It's so funny. I should have this one. Like we we should automatically give this answer because I, I get asked it almost every time I talk about it. Um, you need to check with your corporate counsel. It, it is actually not written anywhere in official. Most people believe it is where the candidate resides, not where the employer is. If you look at this, the law that um, New York City just recently passed, where um, you cannot test for THC, started in May of 2020, for people working in New York City, then in that case, it is where they work, not where they live. But you really have to check with your corporate counsel because there is not, it's a, it's a gray area and you just sort of pick your choice and your policy, make sure your corporate counsel is okay with it. And then you follow the policy consistently across all of your employees. Um, and, and that's the best bet, but you've got to check. There is, it is not written in stone anywhere. Okay. If someone smokes a regular cigarette before using the breathalyzer, what effect will that have on the results? Um, well, as part of any collection procedure and the requirements for our device, we have the donor be observed and not put, if you've ever done oral fluid, you're pretty familiar with this, right? So you don't use, um, you don't use or put anything in your mouth, what mouthwash, mint, eat, drink, etc. Smoke is one of them, but our system only tests for Delta 9 THC. Um, we have done extensive testing and human subject testing. And as part of that, we do interference testing. Nicotine is one of those substances. It doesn't affect our equipment or our ability to test for the Delta 9. And that's the only thing we test for. Okay. Is the use intended primarily for pre-employment, reasonable suspicion after an incident, or, or random? Um, well, <laughs> It depends on your workplace. Um, random in some people's workplaces tends to be a dirty word. And I think the genesis, I don't think, I know the genesis is, of that is unions generally do not like random testing because they felt like it was a little bit of a big brother thing. But uh, Sammy, Dabs and I spent a lot of time talking about this and we actually believe that the best use is what we call pre-access. And so just like alcohol, if you have a highly sensitive position, you can do pre-employment alcohol testing, but you really have to be able to show. And again, I, I, I'm a huge person, I'm a huge, huge advocate of, of really in an HR setting, lobbying that safety is no longer just physical safety and all those other safety measures as employers, we have to really be pushing to say, broaden what safety is. But really, you know, alcohol pre-employment you have to prove safety sensitive 
um, and we would be in the same category, we believe. So there's applicability. You don't want somebody to show up high for the interview. But again, if you think back to that, that whole discussion about the window, you've got to think, what's the purpose of pre-employment and using this? And does it fit your purpose? Pre-access is actually the application we love the most because it is that sort of continuous testing and verification. It really is before somebody shows up on the job site or after returning or in the office after returning from a break that they are selected. And again, in an impartial, random way and that you test a percentage of your employees, whatever it is, every day, every week, every month, um, and you continue to test. So random is great, pre-employment is great, post-accident and reasonable suspicion go without saying they're fantastic. Because right now, if you use one of the existing drug testing methodologies, you can use this along with it and say, yeah, 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 like we did our oral fluid test or we did our urine test. And then when, when and if you're challenged, they say, yeah, but I used over the weekend. You say, no, 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 you didn't because we have the Helnaps breathalyzer test. We know that if it was in your breath, that you use very recently. And that really is a great piece of information for you to have as an employer. So it really works for most use cases in the workplace and for most jobs and job applications, but you really just wanna sort through what is it you're trying to do and how does it work best in your location and, and you can really use it across the board. Okay, I think kind of on the, the safety sensitive position, there, there's a question, would you recommend testing two to three hours after employees have reported to work or you know, when would be the best time to test with the, the breathalyzer? Um, I believe that, that you know, again, if, if your purpose is deterrence, um, and, and I believe that should really be one of the most important pieces of anybody's policy, then you want to do it in, in different times, right? So there's a little bit of variety that helps you because as soon as your testing programs become measurable, someone will work around it. Um, and we've seen that over the course of, of the industry and the history of the industry with urine, right? So stealth comes on the market and then and then we start to test for it. And so, so then another adulterant comes on the market and then another adulterant comes on the market. And then you can buy the Wizenator and then you can buy freeze dried urine. And then, you know, so um, I, I believe that the best options are immediately when someone clocks in, immediately when someone logs into their desktop, after they come back from lunch, random, right? It is it is different times, different ways, and different um, sites. And that's the way that you best deter use because people think it could happen at any time. Hmm. And that's how they make the choice, just not to use it while they're at work. So I have one uh, final question. I think it's a follow-up to each of the last two, but I just want everyone to know it's it, we're right at time. Some people may have to leave. I want everyone to know there is a handout again as a reminder on the GoToWebinar tool. We'll be sending out a communication with a link to the recording if you want to share this with others, listen to it again. And we also, in our communication as a follow-up to today's webinar, will be including a the opportunity for you to join a wait list, as Nina mentioned uh, during her, her remarks. The product uh, will ship a little bit later this year. And so they're creating a, a wait list for two purposes. One, to let the, obviously keep you in sync with when the products will be available for market and use, et cetera, and so on. But I would imagine there'll be a, additional collateral that you'll be interested to read, they'd be interested to share and, and for you to read in the meantime. So all of that's coming. And my, my final question is, it's kind of inspired, I, I think a little bit by all these questions, as well as the photo of the, you know, the heavy machinery equipment, bulldozers and whatever. And I just envision you know, big work sites where there's thousands, hundreds, thousands of people and there's a whole bunch of machines. And you've mentioned this term pre-access, which I, I'm not sure I've thought too much about before. Can you, can you speak to that? I mean, is, and how, how that's gonna work? And I, I guess I think not only just the testing, you've mentioned the random and whatnot, but it, the window is two to three hours where someone's impaired. It, can you just say, hey, they, they come at eight o'clock, they're high, and you, you, you have them wait around till noon and they can work the rest of the day? Or, I mean, can you speak to that sort of long-winded well, ramble? No, yeah, I can. I mean, because it is interesting. This is so stuff that we sit around and we talk about all the time. Never think, something I never thought I'd say, um, but we do. And so how, different companies 
based on what their intent is of their policy, will do different things. We've heard some companies come to us and say, what we're going to do is we're going to stand them down the first time because this is new and everybody's learning. So we're going to stand them down the first time. And we're going to say, you know, you, you can't work for the eight hour shift. Others who are going to say, no, it's, a, you know, if, if we are we are very precise and, and we tell you that you can use on your own times, but we've invested in this um, technology so that you understand that you are not allowed to show up here having recently used. And so I think when you're thinking about a job site of any sort, right, an office or like you said, the heavy equipment and the heavy machinery, you decide what is best for your employees. You know, do you want to have an employee assistance program? Do you want to allow them to have to, like a DOT program where you go to a substance abuse professional and you have an evaluation done and what can your EAP do, do or what, you know, do, do you pay for treatment and then they come back? It really is dependent upon your own particular, I love designing programs. Um, with employers and saying what really best fits your needs. I know you guys at Orange Tree do that very well. It is defining what's best and then, you know, rolling that out, collecting the data and then modifying it. Like your drug testing policy needs to be a living, breathing, changing document. It's not one you just create, shove in a drawer and hope for the best for the next 10 years. And so I'd say that you start doing it um, regularly that's your deterrence, and then you have it available in the event of that incident or accident as well, and you decide, is it 50%, is it 100% of new employees? As long as you're doing it in a non-discriminatory way, you design what that percentage, you know, are you gonna do a 100% of, of your, your safety sensitive when you're talking about like the forklift drivers, right? Are you gonna do 100% of them every year? And then anybody who is deemed less physically safety sensitive, you're gonna do 50% of your employee body over the course of a year. You can be creative um, to meet your needs with your policy and your program, as long as you're doing it in a non-discriminatory and, and, and a consistent way, you can really design what works for you the best. Nina, thank you very much. I, I think I could continue for a while, and I think we have some people who could continue to ask questions, but uh, we'll have to leave it at that for today. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. If you have questions, you can certainly send me a, a communication and we'll get you all of the, the information that uh, you desire. Thank you very much for joining us on our webinar today. Have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.